everybody, and uh, thanks for coming today. I hope you've had as much fun at this conference as I have, and a big shout out to everybody who's working behind the scenes to make this happen for us. My name is Jason. I'm a senior infrastructure engineer on the platform team at CrowdStrike, and I'm here to talk to you today about our journey deploying console at scale. Uh, a little bit about me, I uh, have some prior experience deploying console at a smaller scale uh, in a previous company and was actually at this conference in 2018 as part of that project, so I'm really excited to be back as a speaker. So a little bit of background about CrowdStrike. Uh, our company was founded in 2011. We are a cybersecurity company that provides a cloud-native platform for securing endpoints, cloud workloads, identity, and data. We have over 3,000 engineers on staff. Uh, we have over 95,000 compute nodes that are split across EC2 and on-prem networks. They're serviced by 40 separate console clusters and seven vault clusters. So a little bit of background about this project. A fleet of this size doesn't happen overnight. We were a startup once. Uh, we had a small customer base, and as that grew, the size and complexity of our network uh, infrastructure grew along with it. Problems that had once been easy to solve out of the box became uh, difficult to manage or expensive as we grew. And now, as you've probably seen in your own journeys, there's not an always an obvious point at which it becomes worth the time and the investment to adopt some of these transformative technologies like service catalog, discovery, network infrastructure automation, secret management, even CICD, right? This is the, this is the challenge uh, for DevOps in general, I think. And if you're out there right now and you're seeing all of these cool technologies and you're trying to figure out how you can get buy-in from the people that you work with, from your bosses, from the people that make the money, and the, the money decisions, then I would say to find a specific use case that has uh, an obvious value to the business that you can demonstrate and hyper-focus on that. Set some guardrails, right? It's really easy to get excited about all of the things that these technologies can do, especially console anymore can do a lot, right? So, so hyper-focus on that, set yourself some guide rails and, and, and sell that to your partners, right? So for us, that use case had to do with load balancers. They're kind of that classic example of an out of the box solution that, uh, that is easy and reliable right out of the gate, right? But as your infrastructure grows, they can become uh, both expensive and there are some technological limitations that you can run into, like a hard limit on the amount of uh, instances you can have in a target group, things like that. And so we're a really big AWS customer. We traditionally spend millions of dollars a year on simple east-west load balancing. So for us, there was a lot of obvious value in finding a tool that could help us provide an alternative way for just connecting clients to endpoints, right? Simple, simple uh, a service discovery and registration. Actually, real quick. So we came up with a list of requirements uh, for the tool in this space, right? I'm a, I'm a Hashi fanboy. I knew console was the tool. I've been pushing it since I started here. But I still wanted to demonstrate to the business that this was the tool for the job, right? And so we came up with a list of requirements. It needed to be fault tolerant, highly available, had to support our network infrastructure. We wanted robust health checks as good as or better than what we were getting out of the box with our load balancing solutions. And it needed to easily integrate with DNS. So we, we analyzed all the tools that were in this space, put them through this uh, requirement matrix, and the few that came out at the other end, we built proof of concepts for them. We built the clusters, we put them through their paces, kicked the tires, and at the end of that process, surprise, surprise, console came out on top as the best fit for our use case. Now, a little bit about our network infrastructure. Uh, we are hybrid multi-cloud, um, and so what does that mean? There's some kind of different definitions for that, right? So we have multiple uh, private clouds that uh, each one is comprised of one or more AWS VPCs and uh, data center uh, on-prem regions that are all connected in a flat network, but each cloud is an island. We don't replicate data between them. Uh, each one kind of exists unto itself. Our largest production cloud has around 60,000 uh, compute nodes in it, and the next largest is uh, pretty close behind, coming up on about 30,000. 
And so we knew when we first sat down to build this architecture that gossip was going to be one of our biggest challenges. Now, if you're an enterprise customer, this is kind of, you've got a simpler solution here, right? You, you've got an easy way to separate your gossip layer and to let network boundaries and have a single uh, you know, cluster backend for that. But if you're using open source, then it takes a little bit of creativity. Now we drew our inspiration from Bloomberg's fantastic case study about 20,000 nodes and beyond, right? Google it, watch it. It's a great talk and it will, it will help kind of set the stage for, for if, for console if you're dealing with it at scale, right? So in our implementation, uh, we decided to divide our gossip layers by availability zone. So AZ1, AZ2, AZ3, right? Clients in those availability zones have a dedicated console cluster that they connect to. Now the clusters themselves still span AZs for resiliency, but the clients for each of those AZs, both on-prem and in public cloud, they connect to a dedicated cluster. So not only does this create like a logical boundary that's really easy for everybody to grok, but it makes your configuration management dead simple, right? You don't have to come up with some kind of like complicated hashing algorithm or ordinals to decide what clients are gonna to go to what clusters. Every client knows what availability zone it's in and it can connect to that easily, right? And this created for us a pretty simple federation model. Essentially, we have six clusters per cloud. We don't have to worry about replicating data between them. Uh, and now with some of the new announcements around uh, uh, around console's new capabilities with peering. We may even take advantage of some of that to extend this further, but for right now, it's a pretty simple federation model. And within each of these clouds, we make use of prepared queries for a sort of localized form of geo failover, right? And so this just says that if the service in my local availability zone is down, give me the results from the next two closest. All right, so we've decided how we're gonna build this thing, right? We know we're gonna need a lot of clusters and they're gonna be spread across EC2 and on-prem networks. So our next challenge was how are we gonna provision this, right? Definitely not by hand. <laughs> it's a lot of work and it's too much, right? And we already have a pretty strong uh, Terraform workflow in our platform team. We use it for deploying applications already and we also use it for uh, building out new clouds, deploying the VPC infrastructure and all the requirements for that. So that was a pretty obvious choice for us. We built a couple of Terraform modules uh, that, to make the process repeatable and took advantage of some of the cool stuff like the for loops that you can do to really dry up our code. So I wanna talk a minute about why we didn't put this in Kubernetes. We're, why are we building this in, uh, on virtual machines in EC2 and on-prem? At CrowdStrike, we do use Kubernetes uh, extensively, but we build it the hard way from scratch. And so there are uh, provisioning requirements there for just the maintaining ongoing health of the clusters and for building new ones. And so we wanted to avoid uh, a lot of complicated interdependencies with uh, between console and Kubernetes that could make it difficult to either stand up new clusters or to uh, you know, resolve problems with existing clusters. So we know how we're gonna build it, we know where, right? Now we have to decide how big it's gonna be. Now there's uh, a lot of great information online about sizing. In fact, this graphic was cribbed from, uh, from HashiCorp's own website, right? But the things that you wanna keep in mind is that your size needs to be tailored to your use case. So this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, right? Set the guardrails on what your service is going to do and hyper-focus on that. And that will help you in this garden of forking paths of configuration options and sizing. It's gonna help you focus in on what's the most, what are the most important elements to maintain the stability and performance of your cluster. So the things to keep in mind, you've probably heard this in some other talks, console is write limited by disk IO it's uh, read limited by CPU, but memory is a factor either way. You need to allocate two to four times the amount of memory as your working set of data within console. So if, if console's internal data sets a gig, you need at least four gig of memory, right? And remember that the catalog service information, all that's included. So even if you're not using KV or some of these other capabilities, there is still a data set that you need to, that you need to consider. And give yourself the uh, ability to scale vertically as needed and let your metrics be your guide on that. So once we decided where to build console, how, how big it's gonna be, we had to come up with a security plan. 
Now, as you've heard elsewhere, console has three pillars to its security framework, mutual TLS, surf gossip encryption, access control lists. Now, as you've probably seen with other applications, you need to strike a balance between security, usability, and functionality. And these three elements kind of exist as separate axes on a pyramid. And the closer you get to one, the further away you get from another. And with console, you're going to need to strike that balance for each of these three components. Now, for us, even though this is all internal east-west traffic, we're a cybersecurity company, it was super important for us to, uh, to, to enable these methods and enforce them, right? Like we heard earlier, uh, assume breach. And so we knew though that it was going, to, that we needed a, a, a secure and reliable way to manage and deliver these secrets across all of these sprawling clusters. This is where Vault comes in and I get really excited because I love Vault and I hope you guys do too. It's one of the, most amazing tools in this space, in my opinion, and I just personally enjoy working with it. So the first problem we had to tackle were console server certificates. Now, in theory, I guess you could use your existing PKI infrastructure. We obviously have our own pre-existing PKI infrastructure at CrowdStrike, right? But these console server certificates, since they're being used for MTLS, they're part of your authentication mechanism. And so you want them to be signed by a dedicated certificate authority. You need to have some certain things in the SAN to help with the functionality of the cluster, right? Local host and domain names for each of your federated clusters. And you don't want them to be long lived. And so I'm not gonna cover too much of this. I think we've all heard enough about static and dynamic secrets. Dynamic secrets, good. Static secrets, less good, right? But it's part of the, the crawl, walk, run model. And you're gonna need to incorporate them at some point. And as you'll see here in a little bit, we, we, we do have one static secret that we're using for this model. But for our dynamic secrets, we're taking advantage of Vault's PKI secret engine to create our dedicated CA and to uh, generate and deliver the certs for our console servers on demand. We use the Vault agent running on each console server. It authenticates with whatever mechanism is appropriate for where that cluster lives. So for example, in EC2, we take advantage of IAM uh, authentication and the uh, agent will fetch, authenticate, fetch your cert, write it to disk, reload console. And uh, when the cert reaches two thirds of the way to expiration, you automatically request a new one, write it to disk and reload the agent. So not only does this make our life easier as uh, operators so that we don't have to deal with the delivery and rotation of these certificates when they expire, but it makes the provisioning for these new clusters a snap, right? You get Vault up, you configure it correctly to deliver its PKI, and the very first console node that comes up in your primary data center has certificates right from the start. You don't have to go through some kind of complicated provisioning process where it comes up disabled, you add the certs, and then you enable it. Right from the start, you've got MTLS enabled. So the console client certificates, I guess in theory, you could probably use the vault agent for those as well, but you don't need to because console connect acts as an internal CA for console and allows your uh, clients to present a CSR for a leaf certificate to be signed by the console backend automatically. So you don't have to deliver any certif you, certificates, certificates except for the public CA certificate. That you don't technically have to if you disabled verification, but you should, because you want to make sure your clients are connecting to the correct backend. And now something to keep in mind when we're talking about doing this at scale is that there is a CPU cost to this operation. And so it's a good idea to limit the number of cores that are available for signing uh, so that you don't overwhelm your backend when you're initially provisioning all of your clients, right? Or maybe when your root CA expires. All right, so <clears throat> the next element of this, the next challenge with security are the access control lists. Now, if any of you have dealt with consoles ACLs, you know that they can be a little bit tricky, right? They're, you can run into some kind of chicken and egg scenarios and so I would recommend that if you can, and if it works in your workflow, to take advantage of Vault's dynamic console backend. Uh, that will give you kind of the same benefits that we talked about with the certificates, right? But for your uh, console ACL tokens. Now, we decided not to go that route for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one of which is that we already have an existing secret management system that's kind of tied into everybody's workflow. They're already familiar with how to use it, and it has its own way of uh, our back and dealing with permissions, right? So, so for us, it made sense to, uh, to, to, 
to generate these consoles and store them statically. And, and this is kind of back to that balancing act, right? Like we get some additional usability at the sacrifice of, of some security that we would get if these were more shorter uh, lived credentials. And it also keeps uh, keeps Vault out of the hot path and prevents us and, and keeps us so we don't have to put agents on 100,000 nodes. Um, but we do use Vault to manage tokens for human users and for CICD. So gossip encryption, the next element of this, right? It's a lot simpler. It's a, it's a string. As far as I know, there's no way to manage it dynamically, but you do want to rotate your gossip, uh, encryption keys tokens. And so you want to give yourself the ability in whatever your configuration management or, or operations tools are to, uh, to disable the verification, the incoming and outgoing verification for gossip so that you can rotate that key at some point in the future. And this, uh, so this gossip encryption key is our one static secret. We actually store that in vault, uh, rather than in our traditional secret management system for, uh, reasons that I'll, I'll talk about here in a minute. I want to talk a little bit about vault post provisioning. So these things that we've talked about, these dynamic secret backends and, and these authentication engines, and they, they have a lot of moving parts, right? There's, there's roles, there's policies, the engines themselves, there's a lot of different tuning, uh, options. When we did our initial proof of value, uh, deployments in our lower environments, we basically just kind of worked through the process of enabling all this by hand and translated that into shell scripts, right? But that quickly became unsustainable. Uh, you know, as, as you, as you learn, as you grow, as you deploy these clusters, you're going to want to come back and tune things. You're going to want to maybe shorten some TTLs, maybe lengthen some other ones, change some token types from service to batch. You're going to want to remain adaptable with that. And if you've got shell scripts that you're using to manage this, it's going to be a real pain. So we took advantage of the vault provider for Terraform to do a complete end to end configuration of vault. And so in our, our, our provisioning process now, we bring up that first vault node in the cluster, right? We, 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 we initialize it so that we can get our root token and then we run our Terraform and everything else is done. From that point, now we can stand up console vaults there ready to handle all of the dynamic secrets. And as operators going forward, when we want to tune these things, uh, when we want to add policies, change things, right? We've got a really simple way to do it and it's, it's infrastructure is code, right? That should be, that should be our goal for everything. So as I've kind of touched on, uh, we use Chef. We are a Chef shop uh, for our traditional, uh, you know, VM-based infrastructure. Um, we wrote cookbooks for Vault and Console from the ground up for this project. Uh, we don't use a golden image model, so our last mile with Chef is long, but that also gives us a lot of flexibility in, uh, in, in exposing some of these different configuration endpoints and that to give us the ability to, to, to tune the configuration of these clusters, uh, as we need. So, and, and if you're going this route and you're, you're, you're working with Chef and cookbooks, I highly recommend you set up a testing pipeline, right? Use Test Kitchen. Make sure that you're, that you're actually testing these things. And if you can use kitchen nodes to, to build a real cluster with Test Kitchen that connects everything together, that's going to give you a lot of confidence when you're making changes before they even hit your development environment. So, we also use Chef as our mechanism for fetching these two initial secrets, right? So as I mentioned, the, the console client certificates, we need to provide the, the public CA cert, and we need to provide a gossip encryption key. Now, as I said, we didn't want to have to put the vault agent on everything, but we need everything to be able to fetch these secrets. Our existing secret management tool is not currently consumed by every single node. You're right. We've got NTP servers, certain things that don't need secrets. And we didn't want to make that a requirement for registering with Vault. We want every compute node on our network registered with Vault, even if all it's doing is just sitting there as a member of, of, of or sorry, register with console, right? Even if it's just sitting there as, as, as part of the catalog. 
And so we came up with a method that allowed us to do a sort of semi-anonymous authentication using APRIL uh, combined with some kind of information that's already available on our any node that's being provisioned with our normal provisioning process, right? So we wrote a custom library in Chef that will do the authentication with that sort of semi-anonymous authentication method. We use uh, batch tokens so that they're just a throwaway, right? We only need them for a few minutes for the duration of that chef run and then we throw them away and if you haven't used batch tokens or looked into that they're a fantastic uh, uh, use case for this model right when you don't need to be tracking leases they're super short-lived these batch tokens have very little performance impact on vault and when you're dealing with tens of thousands of nodes that's really important because as we'll touch on later your lease count in vault is one of your your biggest indicators of how it's going to perform right the more leases you get the more cpu and the more disk you're going to consume on vault all right, so we know how we're going to build everything, right? How we're going to secure it. How are we actually going to connect things together? Now, this ended up being a little bit more of a complicated problem than we originally imagined. So right out of the gate, I was super excited about cloud auto join, right? We're going to use tags and we're going to hook everything up together that way. And that was how I did the server clusters. It was great. Then when I went to, to start connecting clients to this, I realized that we were going to have to grant EC2 described instance permissions to everything in our, in, in our EC2 fleet, right? And that, that wasn't, that's not a great uh, security model for us. There's a lot of additional things you get out of that besides just just the ability to read tags. And so, and, and we also needed a way to grant our on-prem hosts uh, the same kind of permissions or the same, either the same permissions through some kind of wacky way that they can read tags or else you have to give them an alternate method. So in the end, we, uh, we ended up settling on uh, load balancers as our model, but I do want to call out that there is an issue if you are using cloud uh, auto join where you cannot pass a custom, EC2, a custom EC2 endpoint into the join. And, and apparently this is a problem with the underlying Go discover library and it kind of became an issue for us because we're in the process of, of, of restricting some egress and we don't want to be going to these public endpoints and so if any of the maintainers are out there if you're listening and you want to solve uh, issue 104 on the github page I will buy you a pizza <laughs> so once our clusters were built and we actually began operating console as a service and onboarding our partners we began to realize that the dealing with consoles uh, policies and tokens manually was going to be a problem. All right. In the beginning, we were just creating the policies and tokens for our servers, and that was all that we really needed. But as we began to onboard stuff, it was the same problem with Vault, right? You've got this sprawling uh, infrastructure. You've got, even though you know all your policies and tokens are managed on your primary data center, or they should be, you should replicate to make your life easier, right? It's still, we've got all these different clouds that we have to deal with. And clicky clicking through the UI, typey typing is just not a sustainable activity. We're a really small team, so and we don't want to spend all day doing that. So again, we leveraged a Terraform provider, the console, uh, a provider for Terraform will let you manage all of your objects with code. And not only did this make our lives easier, but it enabled us to provide a self-service model for our partners, right? Our internal customers. As I mentioned, we're using open source. We don't have the ability to do any kind of multi-tenancy. So this is a service that we're providing for our other customers within uh, CrowdStrike. And so this model using Terraform to define these policies and, and provision these tokens gives you a way of providing self-service. Now, when one of our customers has a new service that they wanna onboard into console, they just need to make a PR gives us the chance to review it. We can make sure there's no conflicts with other services, right? That the name's gonna be resolvable through DNS, all of that good stuff. It doesn't exceed a character limit, right? We can do some validation. And then when we merge that PR, we can have a CI CD process that comes along, authenticates with Vault, gets a token to console, applies the changes for us. And that takes a lot of the operational burden off of us during onboarding and, and really helps us accelerate that process. And one thing to mention in this model, uh, why limit user access? Uh, uh, one of the things is that this, the ACL system doesn't let you scope 
your permissions on these uh, objects very well, right? So if you have permission to, to create policies, to edit policies, you have permission to edit all the policies, your own policy, the you know anonymous policy, whatever. So that was another reason that uh, in this model that we wanted to not provide a whole lot of direct access. But we do update the anonymous policy to provide greater visibility into console without having to provide a token. We want everything to be able to read from the catalog, right? So also on the topic of, of operations, you want to automate your upgrades. Now, coordinating upgrades and restarts with this many clusters is already a challenge, but there are some sort of prescriptive practices when it comes to upgrading console and vault, all right? So in the case of federated console clusters, you wanna upgrade the primary data center first, the secondary data centers last, and on a per cluster level, you wanna upgrade the leader last, right? So all the followers first, followed by the leader. And you wanna do the same thing really if you've got to restart for some reason, right? Let's say you've made a, a configuration change that can't be applied with just a simple reload. You don't just wanna fire off restart starts all at once, randomly do it. You want to be in control of that process. And furthermore, you want to do it in a way where you maintain the health and stability of the cluster. And so this means that after you know each node, you should wait until autopilot reports a healthy status for the previous node before you move on to the next one. So if you're doing this by hand and you've got 40 clusters times five nodes each cluster, right? That's a, you could spend all day in front of your terminal just staring at output and hitting a button when, when things are ready to go, right? So it will really help you to come up with some kind of automation, whether it's through Ansible or some kind of Python tooling, whatever your choice is, to make your life easier as an operator because you want to have a low bar for upgrades, right? As, as others have mentioned, you don't want to get more than two versions behind with console, I'm guessing with Vault 2, because you could end up with some backwards compatibility issues. And so even if you're not interested in a new feature that's coming out, you're not interested in some kind of security fix that's there, you wanna stay on top of these upgrades so that when something does happen, when there is something critical that comes out, you don't have a complicated upgrade path to get there. Along with that, you want to bring your own binaries, right? You want to roll your own packages. Now, I'm not saying you have to compile everything from source. Maybe you could, right? But you don't want to rely heavily on community vendor packages as convenient as they are because you're really buying into whatever their prescriptive model of how console or vault needs to be installed, right? What the data directories are, how the service files created. You might want to have some more control over that. And so I highly recommend that you take control of that package packaging process, and, and also just to avoid some of these supply chain attacks that are becoming really common, right? And so <clears throat> it's a good idea, package your binaries. If you don't have a model for that already and it seems intimidating, take a look at FPM Cookery. It's a fantastic project. We make really heavy use of it at CrowdStrike. And again, you're, now you're talking about all of your package definitions exist as code. A simple PR when a version changes with the new MD5 sum, you're good to go. It builds your package, publish it in your artifact management system, and you can avoid these supply chain issues and some of the unpredictability that comes with using other people's packages. So now let's talk about the most exciting part, which is monitoring, right? So even when you're operating at a small scale, your monitoring dashboard is your cluster, right? It is the X-ray view into the body of the beast that you are dealing with. It's going to tell you information about the health and the activity of the back end that you're not going to get from looking at the UI, right? It's going to tell you about the gossip network, API latency, leader elections, autopilot health, all of these really valuable indicators of problems. Uh, you want to be highly visible and, and, and readily available to you. Same with Vault, right? You're going to get all of these system performance and cluster activity, lease counts like I talked about, and of course, disk space, memory, CPU. Disk and memory are particularly important. You do not want to run out of disk. You do not want to run out of memory, or you could get yourself into a situation where it's really difficult to recover from that because you've affected your data integrity. Hopefully you're taking backups, but you still don't want to have to get into a place where you have to restore from backup. 
Now, if you're using a tool like Grafana that uh, for your visualizations that lets you annotate, do that. Because when you first go to implement all this, you're gonna do, hopefully, a whole lot of research on what are the valuable metrics, right? What am I looking for? What's normal, what's not? And then six months later, when you have a problem in the middle of the night, you're gonna go look at this dashboard and you're gonna not remember what this is supposed to indicate, right? Is this bad, is this good? What does it mean that my oldest raft log is seven days old? Is it supposed to be shorter than that, right? So, so you wanna annotate your panels to give yourself a little bit of a clue about what you're looking for, not only for yourself, but for other people on the team and for the newbies that you bring on to help you support this thing, you wanna give them some guidance. Another thing I wanna point out is that when you're, when you're dealing with these clusters in, in sort of the default configurations, especially for open source, right? There's one node in each cluster that's really doing the heavy lifting. Right now, that changes a little bit with performance standbys, things like that. If you're uh, if you're an enterprise customer, or if console, if you're doing stale reads, right, that changes a little bit. But but just assume that there's one node in your cluster that's really doing the heavy lifting, and so you don't want to rely too heavily on averages because something critical could get lost in the mix there, right? You wanna have uh, somewhere really visible on your dashboard, the sort of max indicators, the worst indicators, right? I wanna know the least amount of disk space that I have. I wanna know the most amount of memory utilization that I have, because that's gonna focus you in on where your problem is. There we go. So it's sort of my picture demo here. I've kind of I've got an example of of what I mean with these dashboards. So as you can see, we've kind of got some of the most important gauges at the top, right? We've got those max indicators that I talked about, and we also have a TLS certificate expiry, right? We're going to trust that Vault's doing its job, absolutely, but we're going to verify as well because if for some reason you have a problem with your agent or you have a problem with the Vault backend and those certificates don't expire or don't renew when they expire, you're going to have a bad time. And so you want to stay ahead of that. You want to make sure that that's highly visible in your, in your monitoring. I also like to keep an eye on uh, the registration. Those are the, that sort of line bar that you see there. That's going to help you identify if you've got flapping in your gossip layer, right? You want a fairly flat line there that doesn't have a whole lot of ups and downs, or that could indicate that you've got a problem. So <clears throat> that's the, you know, the stuff that we keep at the top. And then as you scroll down through these, there's, you're going to have some additional information about the sort of application metrics, right? So these might not be things, you might not need them at the top. They might not need to be as readily available. But when you spot a problem, you want all of these different metric points available to help you correlate, right? To help you understand what might be happening. You want to know if you've got uh, leader elections happening all the time. You want to know if your autopilot health is flapping up and down, right? And so, as you, you know, further on in your dashboard, you can put that additional information. And then of course, somewhere in there, you should have the actual individual system metrics that have the CPU, the memory, the disk that we talk about, right? You don't want to run out of memory. You don't want to run out of disk space. So Vault's very similar, right? We've got our gauges at the top that kind of give us those key indicators of our performance and the, the health of our cluster. Like I mentioned, leases, right? That's right there front and center. That's one of the most important things that you need to be looking for. And then again, as you scroll down, you can have your additional information that tell you about some of the more specific performance uh, indicators. You can, with the vault monitoring, we're using Prometheus metrics here, by the way, but they're the same endpoints, whether it's the, the built-in or Prometheus. And we, um, we try and identify all of the different uh, backends, right? The PKI console, whatever we're using, we want metrics from each of those. All right. Now, you're not going to catch everything with metrics alone, as valuable as they are, right? They won't tell you the whole story. You need to aggregate the logs from your servers and your clients. Uh, this is going to help you spot problems that might go unnoticed in your metrics, especially at the client layer, right? It might not be practical for you to gather console uh, metrics from every single agent in, the, in, in your network, but you still want to have an indicator of problems, things like certificates uh, that may have expired, you know, problems getting the leaf certificate on the clients, problems with ACL tokens, that kind of thing. You want to know, and especially, you know, in our big cloud, 60,000 nodes, if 100 nodes are having a problem, that's really easy to escape our notice. But if we've got, a, if we've got good uh, log aggregation in place, and especially if we have some kind of dashboard for that same sort of visibility, then it's going to help us get ahead of problems that may not actually be impacting the cluster, but could be impacting uh, a customer experience or, or preventing us from having visibility in something that we need to. 
And don't forget about alerts. I know you won't, but don't. <laughs> You're not going to catch everything staring at dashboards every day, scrolling through, clicky clicking, right? You need reliable alerting. You need to get ahead of problems. And a lot like monitoring, there is a delicate art to identifying the right metrics and setting the right thresholds in a way that are, is going to allow you to spot a problem before it becomes an emergency, but isn't going to wake you up every night with false positives. There are some really great resources online for helping you uh, identify some of these key metrics that you should alert on and, and even giving you some thresholds to get you started. Uh, I've linked those on this slide here, but the, 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 it's really what I've called out here are the internal console and vault documentation about this. And also, I don't know how often people think of it, but Datadog's documentation for monitoring is fantastic. Even if you don't use Datadog, they have really detailed information about these different metric endpoints and some of the similar stuff that HashiCorp is telling you about thresholds that you need to set. Just be aware if you're looking at those documents that some of those endpoints are uh, exclusive to the Datadog agent. So, you know, your mileage may vary there. Something else to call out with alerts is that if you can, if you've got the ability, you want to create multiple tiers of alerts, right? So not everything is an emergency. There's only really certain things that you're necessarily going to want to be woken up about in the middle of the night. As you can guess, those are going to be things like lease counts, memory, disk. Don't run out of memory. Don't run out of disk. You want to be woken up about those things so that you can get ahead of those problems. Otherwise, when you come in in the morning, you might not have an easy time recovering from that. Now, <clears throat> metrics, not only they're important for catching problems, right? They're, they're, they're critical for that, as we're saying. But something that, that you may not have, that you may not think about is that the metrics also help you learn what normal looks like for your customer, for your cluster, right? So if you're new to console or if you're deploying console at a scale like you've never done before, as I am, right? You don't really know what normal looks like. And so it's a really good idea to get your metrics in place right from the start. You know, I know sometimes, especially for me, monitoring sometimes becomes the afterthought, right? You know, it's GA, now we'll set up some monitoring and alerts for it, right? In this case, I did it right from the, the ground up. The very first uh, dev cluster that went up before I did anything in prod, we had monitoring in place because I was able to use that to establish a baseline for what healthy looks like at these scales. And so, you know, by checking these dashboards, well, I know I say you shouldn't stare at your dashboards. I have been staring at these dashboards for the past few months every morning when I come in because I like to know what normal is. And then that way, when I have a problem, I can go and I can look in there and I can say, okay, yeah, these, are, these response times look normal or these response times don't, right? So the, the monitoring is great, not just for catching problems, but for helping you to understand the health of your cluster. And, and, and kind of on that topic, I want to highly recommend that you you do your deployments and your rollouts in a way where you give yourself a buffer right so the way that we did it we built these clusters months before we ever uh actually onboarded anybody right we registered everything all of the clients and then we just let it bake just to see what the health of the gossip layer was going to be like give us a chance to kind of slowly onboard some friendly services make sure that there's no uh, hiccups in our provisioning process so that by the time we actually began onboarding uh partner services you know our internal customers we already had a really high uh confidence that this thing was going to be stable and it was going to work for us so I want to talk about in the remaining time some of the problems that we ran into uh, during this process, right? So I've mentioned this a few times now, vault lease counts. High lease counts hurt vault performance, right? It's as simple as that. And there are some different kind of scenarios that you can run into that lead to lease counts blowing up. Now, there are uh, some improvements in the vault agent that in 112 that are, that are really gonna help with this. But up until this point, a good example of, of a way that you could wake up in the morning with 100,000 leases, it has to do with the, with the way that the vault agent works. So. We mentioned, right, the vault agent authenticates to vault and then he, uh, he gets the certificate that he needs. He writes it to disk and he reloads the console agent, right? Let's pretend that the console agent isn't configured with the correct gossip encryption key or doesn't have one at all and it can't start. Vault is going to authenticate, or the vault agent is going to authenticate with vault. He's going to fetch that cert. He's going to try to reload and then he's going to fail and he's going to do that same thing over and over and over and over again endlessly out of, like the out of the box behavior, right? And one, a collection of misbehaving nodes 
could cause tens of thousands of leases to accumulate. And the problem with this is that when your lease count gets that high, Vault starts having trouble responding to normal sort of API calls, right? And so you're gonna end up in a situation where you're not able to recover because you can't issue the calls that you need to recover from this. And so, so far all of the high lease count issues that we've seen have been related to the Vault agent. And like I said, there's some new behavior in there. The exit retry, that's not super new, but we did just recently implement that. That's gonna help with this. The new certificate revocation method is really gonna make a big difference here. And there is a new-ish uh, template function um, that apparently has some bug fixes in 112 that are gonna allow us to implement it. But a new template function that uh, is an alternative to the secret function that's called PKI cert that changes the behavior so that it doesn't just automatically ask for a new cert every single time, right? It has some uh, item potency in there where it can verify that the existing cert it has isn't expired and kind of save you some lease counts there. And then at the, also worst come to worst, you do have the ability to not create leases for these certs, but we didn't want to go with that hammer, right? We do actually want the ability to revoke these if we need to. All right, so mass certificate revocations, that kind of goes hand in hand with this. Again, that's something that's gonna be uh, resolved with these new certificate revocation methods that are in, uh, in the new version of Vault. But under the current model up until this point, right, Vault has a hard limit on the certificate revocation list. It's stored in the KV, right? And so it has a limit on its size. And if you exceed that, which I have done a handful of times now, you will not be able to fix it. <laughs> you, if you exceed that limit, you won't be able to queue up any more revocations. They won't just expire on their own when they reach the end. And as far as I can tell, and from what I've been able to gather from talking with the vault folks, your only option is to recover from backup or to rebuild your cluster. So gossip network issues. This is another really interesting one. You've probably heard, I hope you've heard, every node in your gossip pool has to be able to communicate with every other node, right? This is serious. It's not just a suggestion like a stop sign. You have to do this. So if you have persistent communication issues in your gossip layer, one network segment that will not be able to communicate with another, it's gonna cause you problems. So we had an issue when we first deployed our dev cluster where we had a VPC that by design could not uh, communicate with another VPC. And there was a lot of flapping in the gossip network. I didn't care because it was a dev cluster. But we had to, at some point, migrate the console backend to a new subnets, which required destroying those instances and rebuilding them. We ran into an incredibly strange issue where those server nodes that we deleted would start showing back up in the gossip layer as healthy initially, right? Their first hit back in the gossip layer was with a new LAN port time and they were healthy. And that was causing them to show up as potential voters in the raft list. Now, I didn't notice this until we had cycled all five servers. And then we ended up in a scenario where 10 servers are showing up in the, uh, uh, in the raft list and operator was getting really unhappy. We were sites, nodes were coming up, coming down, leader elections. So, Again, this is not a uh, this is not a suggestion. Your nodes absolutely all have to be able to communicate with each other, at least in a persistent way, right? If you have an outage or something, this isn't going to cause this. But the long-term fix for this was to stop console everywhere and delete the console data directory and start everything up. So you don't want to get into a scenario like this, right? Again, don't run out of disk space. You could corrupt your raft DB. You could end up having a really bad time. Storage is generally cheap over provision, right? Practice your recovery procedures. I can't stress this enough. You don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and be fumbling around on uh, HashiCore's excellent documentation about recovering uh, quorum with peers.json or trying to figure out where your backups are stored and how to copy them down to, to restore, right? And there's a certain process involved in all of those recovery uh, uh, options. So you want to practice them and you want to, to give yourself, you know, some kind of chaos engineering, you know, cause problems in your, in your dev and staging clusters and give not only yourself, but the other people on your team, new people that you bring on, whatever, give them the chance to work through these things. Uh, a, a quick note about snapshot backups, right? If you're an open source user, you're very likely going to need to write your own scripts. If you've enabled ACLs on console, you're also going to need to factor that in, right? That, uh, that action requires a token. And so you're going to need to cook up a way to do that. And same with Vault, right? Vault's uh, snapshots are uh, they require authentication. And so make sure to factor that into how you write your policies. All right, and I don't hear this a lot, but I wanna tell you that if you build your vault cluster 
properly, you can just build it from scratch. If it, if, if you really end up in a scenario where you can't recover, oh crap, my backup script was broken and I didn't notice and I don't have backups, right? Vault should be mostly ephemeral. And this is why you want to avoid static secrets as much as possible. We have the one static secret, super easy to put that back, right? But if you, if, if, if you've built Vault right, it's ephemeral. You can delete it, bring it back up, and everything will just work, right? Those vault agents don't need some kind of fancy reconfiguration or anything. As soon as that API is back up and you've got your, you've run your Terraform, right? Another reason to use Terraform in case you can't recover from backup. All you got to do is run that Terraform again. You got all those objects back, right? And then everything just works again. And I can tell you that from experience because I've had to do this several times now as well. And then uh, another thing to note, especially in the beginning, like, so for us, right, we're talking about uh, re uh, reducing our reliance on load balancers. But as we do these migrations, we don't just immediately go and delete the load balancer, right? Leave it up for a little bit and give yourself and your customers a chance to gain some confidence in console's capabilities. And if, God forbid, you run into a problem where console goes down and one thing can't talk to another, you should be able to just update your DNS to point to the load balancer rather than to console's FQDN. And you give yourself a nice way to, to sort of uh, uh, have a workaround for those, those connectivity issues. All right, so in the last little bit here, just some future plans. We wanna do a lot more automation. We wanna make our jobs easier, continue to make our jobs easier as operators, right? We're very interested in chat ops. We have a, our data uh, infrastructure team at CrowdStrike has done some really outstanding work uh, with chat ops that we, wanna, that we wanna incorporate into our workflows. Uh, we're, we're interested in service mesh. As I mentioned before, we're, we're uh, restricting egress and, and dealing with some of these kind of security improvements. And so service mesh is a compelling option for us, as long as we can integrate it in a way that doesn't affect our core use case, right, that we're hyper-focused on, which is service registration and catalog. And then we're also, now that we've got these vault clusters up and in place, we're gonna continue looking at additional use cases for them. So our implementation right now is a very light touch on vault. We don't have a whole lot of uh, performance impact with uh, with what we're doing and so we have some additional opportunities there to sort of improve our internal processes with some of these additional uh, dynamic secrets and we may even find some ways to augment our existing uh, traditional secret management tool with vault and with that I really appreciate everybody's time uh, if you have any questions about this if you want to talk about it I've been eat drinking sleep and breathing it for the last six months and I'm super excited about it so I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards thank you everybody mm -hmm.